about this one? Can you hear this one? Oh, yeah, you got it. You're All the right. Man. Roger, you're the man. <laughs> Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Okay. <laughs> you did it. Wow. Roger, how, I mean, like, wow. How you feeling already? I mean, that was that was quite a uh, uh, you know, an exercise for us. Thank you for your I feel feedback. Like, I feel like Bill Gates. <laughs> <laughs> we 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 struggle through it. We struggle through it. So, uh, Roger, thank you so much for uh, for for being on the show today. Um, it is a huge privilege, a huge honor to have you on. Um, uh, I've been I've been reading through so much things to say. And what a uh, an appropriate book title for what we're talking about today. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, Rastafari, reggae, Bob Marley, and the the life that you have lived, the amazing life. So, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure, Rob. Thanks for having me. So, um, let's start off with uh, with how you got into reggae. I mean, it's such a wonderful story of. Of uh, you're reading the Rolling Stone article, and and I think it was was it Huntley that 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 read the article, that wrote the article. Oh, uh, Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas, right? Gonzo journalist from Australia, hell of a writer, uh, and it was so good that it eventually became a book. It was called The Wild Side of Paradise in Rolling Stone in July of 1973, and then it became a book called Babylon on a Thin Wire, and then it was reproduced and called Jaw Revenge. But the writing of the original article before it got edited and added to is, is just so perfect. And I was in love with Hunter S. Thompson, and mm -hmm. uh, this guy was an Australian version of him. And I'd never heard about reggae before. I'd never even heard the word reggae before in 1973. In America, it just didn't penetrate at all. We had a ska hit with my boy Lollipop, but nobody ever called it ska. And at the end of the, the 60s, we had uh, The Israelites by Desmond Decker and the Aces, but nobody ever called that reggae. It was just a novelty song. And Johnny Nash was making uh, reggae covers and a lot of Marley covers and had hits with songs that Bob wrote especially for him. But I never heard the reggae, word reggae attached to that. So in 73, when Rolling Stone appeared on my doorstep with this article, I read a sentence that changed my life forever. Michael Thomas said, reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. Wow. And it just staggered me. And I went right out of my apartment in Berkeley to a used uh, record bookstore and found a uh, $2.25 used copy of Catch a Fire, the original pressing that opened like a Zippo lighter. And uh, I, I just fell under the reggae spell from the first notes of, Ca of Catch a Fire, uh, the concrete jungle. And I was reading poetry for a living during that period of my life. I had a one-man show called Poetry for People Who Hate Poetry. So it had a huge audience. <laughs> and, um, I was attracted at first more to the words than I was even to the music. But the music has a hypnotic effect on people. And I think that's the real secret of reggae. It is the beat of the healthy human heart at rest. Boom, 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 chaka, chaka, chaka. And that, that helps explain how it had uh, this hold over people uh, once they were exposed to it, regardless of understanding the language or not. It's, it's what you hear in the womb. It's the heartbeat. So uh, babies love it. <laughs> it's a wonderful uh, cooler down for babies. And dogs. <laughs> wow. Well, I mean, that's the one thing. Like, like I, I've, I've always been into lyrics in music, and that's why I've loved heavy metal music. And then when I was in my early twenties, I mean, I knew of Bob Marley. I mean, we all know of Bob Marley, but so few of us really know Bob Marley, and and what he stands for in his music. And I certainly was among them. I mean, I had my misconceptions. But when I first started listening to Bob Marley, when I got the uh, the, the Legends compilation record, uh, Could You Be Loved was on there. Uh, and I remember hearing that and I'm like, whoa, because I only knew Three Little Birds. 
uh, right? And 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 one love. But when I heard this song, and then no woman no cry live, I was like, okay, I'm I'm hooked. Oh, good. And, and and that was my my introduction to to true reggae and and breaking down my misconceptions of it because we we associate reggae music to something that I think Western society can kind of uh, appropriate. Yeah. Well, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, I think one of the most interesting things about reggae is that it has the uh, the capaciousness to accept other forms of music over that basic reggae bed. And reggae has become the uh, the most popular form of protest music in the world. Uh, revolutionary struggles all over the world have used reggae music to promote their ideals. And um, nothing wrong with that. You go to an Aboriginal encampment in the outback of Australia, and they're playing reggae music. You know, the mm -hmm. Maori people in New Zealand. I'm fascinated by that because I always said Maori. Yeah, me too. It's Maori. I, I, I wrist slapped as soon as I got off the plane and said, I want to meet some some Ma 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 Maoris. Uh, and uh, they said, you're not going to meet any here. <laughs> I said, well, <laughs> what do you mean? They said, well, it's Maori. It's like Marley without the L. Maori. Oh, Maori. Yeah. And uh, their national day is uh, February 6th, like our 4th of July in America. And uh, they call it Bob Marley Day now in New Zealand. <laughs> Really? Yeah, and the stations all play Marley music all day long, and you know they, they do special programs in honor of Bob Marley on February sixth instead of celebrating a national political holiday. And, and 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 that's the other thing is that the the sort of this political, social, political um, encouragement of of reggae music. Um, if you look at Bob Marley and the Whalers, their their first record. And when they did simmer down, it was it was very different than obviously what came later. Uh, for example, the Exodus album and um, well, it was an revival. It was yeah, yeah. because it was a politically oriented song. <clears throat> there were a lot of um, killings going on in the yeah. ghetto, and this was a, a an urgent message to simmer down, cool things out, control your temper. So he was involved in, in a social statement right from his very first record with the Whalers. Right. And, and, and you talk about that in, in the book too, the sort of the, the background of, I mean, really these, these three things can't be separated. The, the history of kind of reggae, Bob Marley, Rastafari. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about the backstory of, uh, of reggae music and how, um, was it? Uh, I can see. I can see clearly now. Was written by. Sorry, I'll 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 let you tell a story because I'm no master. Well, it wasn't a Bob Marley song. I, I believe Johnny yes. did that. But it Johnny was, Nash, thank you. Yeah, that's when Johnny Nash was, had yeah. signed the Whalers or Peter and and Bob as songwriters for him, hmm. and his label Jad uh, Records, Johnny Arthur and Danny, they were the three co-founders. Uh, released several singles by the Whalers between 68 and 72, but none of them hit. They couldn't get airplay in America for it. It sounded too strange to American DJ's ears. I don't understand why that was so, but it, it was a fact. Um, Rasta plays a, a great role in roots reggae music. Doesn't have much to do with dance hall, which is a whole different form, and I always make a complete distinction between reggae and dance hall. Mm. Reggae is is conscious music. It's music that elevates. It's music that calls you to a higher purpose, and uh, it's a teaching music. Mm. Um, and at its best, it is not homophobic. It's not misogynistic. Uh, it talks about the unity of the races. And I think that was its appeal to especially a younger audience, not to mention its overemphasis on the use of jaw holy herb. Right. <laughs> right. And uh, 
the the story of Rasta and its creation has never been fully told. Here, here's an incredible book that just came out in France a few years ago, uh, and it's by Bill Howell, whose father, Leonard Howell, founded Rastafari, created Rastafari in a commune known as Pinnacle on the outskirts of Kingston, Jamaica. And it was a, a group of people um, that was organized around certain principles. And he wanted to have some kind of black, almost deified figure to have people, uh, to give people a, a hero to look up to. And he decided that in this century, the figure that most closely resembled what they were looking for was Haile Selassie. He was a nobleman named Ras Tafari, which uh, means head creator. So the Rastafarian will say, so who create the head? It must be God. And um, that, uh, it has been thought of as a religion but it has so many different interpretations that it's hard to think of it as something other than just a movement of like-minded people, people with respect for the earth, for the planet, for the rhythms of the planet. That's why so many indigenous people love reggae music. Um, if you asked Bob, even up to the time of his passing, what he was, he would say, I'm a farmer. Right. Because that's what he did from the time he was three years old. And he'd ride a donkey and bring water to the workers in his grandfather's field up in the mountains of northern Jamaica. Um, but this book, I hope, will get translated into English soon. Uh, it, it's called uh, Pinnacle, the Paradise, the Lost Paradise of the Rastafarians. And um, Bill Howell's father, Leonard Howell, was persecuted by the Jamaican authorities under the British rule and put in jail several times and called a madman. And, uh, you know, he, he had very specific principles involved in what became known as Rastafari. And for those principles, especially the use of ganja, he was persecuted. But uh, the, the philosophy spread to Kingston from, from the commune and various people with their own private interpretations added a lot of levels to it that I don't think uh, Leonard Howell intended. So I'm, I'm helping him to try to find a publisher for this in English because I think it's a major work and it's going to change a lot of people's minds about how Rastafari is, is thought of. One thing that you mentioned in my own, in my own ignorance is uh, I call it Rastafarianism, and that that's, no, that's no. incorrect. Rastafari stands in contradistinction to every other ism on earth, communism, Christism, all mm. of those things. It is not an ism. And that, one of the first times I went to Jamaica and, and said, I'm, I'm here to learn about Rastafarianism, boy, the, <laughs> the scolding I got from the The grand. second time, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. so I, I never said that again. But it's, it's interesting, the, the main newspaper in Jamaica, the, the Jamaica Gleaner, which is very right wing, uh, always refers to it as Rastafarianism, even though they know mm. Rastafarians really resent that terminology. Because, oh, go ahead. It's a way of kind of uh, putting discredit on it. It's, it's like the Repub Republicans in America who call it the Democrat Party instead of the yes. Democratic Party. Right. And they, they use that as an insult. Yes, and, and, and Rastafari is so much more than just a system. It's like a holistic way of life. Like it's Absolutely. completely intangible and in everything, yeah. my understanding. Yeah. Now, uh, there's a fascinating book coming out uh, shortly called The Reggae Nation that a friend of mine, Martin Huisman, in, in Holland has put together. And it's a, a look around the world at all the different cultures who have adapted Rastafari and and reggae music as their own. And uh, I, I recommend that to people. It should be out, I think, within the next month. The, the Reggae Nation by Martin Huisman, H-U-I-S-M-A-N-N. -N. Well, uh, I'll have to try and get him on the show. Yeah, that would be fascinating. I'll give you his contacts. 
Thank you. Yeah. What well, and another piece of of reggae and Rastafari is the dreadlocks. And and I think that that I've I've often wondered, you know, where does that name come from? And it, and it does come from uh, slave slave backgrounds and how um, slave owners would say, you know, oh, it's so so dreadful or something like that. And they they uh, um, champion that term of dreadlock. Is that correct? Well, uh, dread can uh, refer to the power of the almighty God, uh, dread and, and mm. uh, uh, faithful and all the different attributes they ascribe to, to God. Um, it is something that puts uh, the fear of God into you when you see it for the first time. I'll never forget seeing Bob Marley in 1975 at the Paramount Theater in Oakland in, in the, the San Francisco area when he walked out on stage and his dreads barely touched his shoulders in those days, but he looked like some apparition out of some kind of very weird African movie. And when he shook those locks and danced that herky-jerky, loose marionette dance of his, the place just leapt to their feet and screamed and cheered. And, uh, you know, the, the dreads have that effect. And now, you know, you look at... Uh, his son Damien, whose mm. uh, <laughs> dreads are so long they drag behind him when he walks like, yes. like a, a wedding veil, you know. Um, I, I wonder how long Bob's locks would have been had he still been with us, mm -hmm. at least as long as Damien's. Yeah. Well, they inspire dread. Right, right. But then but then it's like there's something about the 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 Rastafari, once you get to know it, it's it might it for me it might look scary because it's so unknown for someone of my background but that's a good thing because then you can come from a place of wanting to understand hopefully right to yeah, to inspire out, right? the dreads are fashionable you open up the new york times style magazine and half the models are black mm. and most of them have dreadlocks right <laughs> you know, so it's not scary anymore it's become co-opted by high fashion mm. yeah interesting how that has happened yeah. Um, now you were talking about seeing Bob Marley live. Now, for me, I was born in 1989. There's no, you know, uh, people ask me if you could see anybody live, who would it be? Bob Marley. And when we see recordings of them live, I mean, it just, like you say, it's, it's almost like he's, he's beyond, especially when he's performing. He's possessed. And, yes. He's, he's in a trance. What was it like seeing Bob Marley live? Oh, it, you know, if he was really on, it was, it was transcendent. It was, uh, it was like a high mass uh, with both senses of the word, a high mass, <laughs> everybody in the audience yeah. smoking. And, and he just took you places that, that you were not going to go with pop music. Uh, wasn't 50 ways to leave your lover or boogie till your Coke spoon falls off your neck. It was... <laughs> How do we get ourselves to a higher state of consciousness? How do we realize that we are all one? I mean, the, the mature philosophy of Bob Marley was not that of the Natty Dread first solo album in 74 when he talked about bombing a church because he knows the preacher's lying. Who's going to stay at home when the freedom fighters are fighting? Then he got shot and almost killed and... Uh, he started thinking differently because the eye for the eye just makes everybody blind and violence was not the answer. And finally, it was that mature one love philosophy that he espoused in the uh, survival album in 79, um, where if we're going to change the world, we must change ourselves yes. first. And that change will radiate outward to the world. So that was a pretty mature way of looking at things. Uh, I mean, he he could go to a stadium in Milan where they play soccer, football, and uh, draw 110,000 people and hold them in the palm of his hands, even though in Italy most people didn't speak English, but they sang along with No Woman, No Cry. Mm. <laughs> and uh, it, it was just such a joy to see the, the hold Bob could have on an audience. And even when it was very, very private, I, I, I was at several sound checks with him during my times with him. And the last show he did in, Cala, in, in LA was at the Roxy after two big shows. And uh, 
it, it, it's a little theater held about, I don't know, maybe 400 people. And at the sound check, I was virtually alone with him for almost three hours where he played all the instruments himself. Wow. He wanted it to be perfect because all the big Hollywood mockers were coming, the music biz people, the, Harlem, the movie stars. And the first hour, he kept singing something over and over and over again I'd never heard before about redemption. And um, I was as moved by that moment as I was by anything in a huge audience that I saw him do. And this was the genesis of the redemption song, is yeah. that correct? Yeah, he was still working on it at that point. This was uh, the end of November 79. That, I mean, that when I heard that song on again on the Legend album, because I heard it from start to finish, and I'd never yeah. heard redemption song before, uh, I mean, wow. I played that song because I, I, I used to be a, a grade seven teacher and I played that song for my class and they were like, what is this? And I made a spelling test based on the words. Anyways, they loved it. And just a message of, you know, how long shall they kill our prophets while we stand aside and look, you know, these, these words that echo today and beyond like forever. He created something that is forever. And that's why the, le the the name legend, you're like, oh, because he 500 years from now, a thousand years from now, you even talk about the the um, time capsule. If, yeah. you know, it, it, in your Library of Congress speech, it's like if we're still here. Anyways, his music is there, which tells us how timeless it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, we, we talk about these great artists of the of the Renaissance, you know, down to the ages, Homer. And the Iliad, the Odyssey, um, uh, you know, Shakespeare, all these names. And we just, we know them as transcendent. And Bob Marley will be that. Bob Marley is that. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand years from now, if there's anybody left, they're going to be singing his songs. Mm -hmm. And they, they are so easily translatable. I mean, how do you translate subterranean homesick blues into Urdu? <laughs> you know, yeah. No woman, no cry. That that you can do that in any language on earth. And 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 one love was the theme for uh, Amnesty Amnesty International. Yeah, and then uh, in '86 when they did that world tour with Springsteen and Sting and everybody, they closed every show all over the earth with one love. But it was also the BBC's anthem of the millennium. As the millennium began in each of the world's 24 time zones, a local group or a singer would sing that song at the, at the top of the hour for the BBC's coverage. So everybody around the world knew One Love. I, I was interviewed, I don't know if you saw it, the interview I did with Phil Kogan, the fellow who created The Amazing Race. And uh, he's been to 130 countries and he said, in every single country he's been to, he has encountered Bob Marley. Every wow. single country. And he wanted to interview me and, and find out why that was so. Uh, it's, it's a fascinating show. It, it's up on YouTube if you go to Bucket, <laughs> Bucket number 21. It's, uh, you know, um, click it before you kick it. <laughs> it's, I, it's kind of a bucket list for him of things he wants to do. So again, speaking to this transcendence piece, Bob Marley and the Whalers, I mean, there were so many, uh, I think in the book you mentioned that a guy named Junior Braithwaite, he was the better singer, according to... Um, everybody. Yeah, according to everybody. Actually, he, from the Whalers. <laughs> right. So there was Bob Marley, there was Junior Braithwaite, uh, there was Peter Tosh, of course, and there was Bunny Whaler. And there were so, two women, Beverly Kelso and Cherry Green, who are on 30 of the Coxon tracks from the original period in the 60s, who so, had hardly any mention anywhere. It took uh, me 20 years to get those women to talk to me. 20 wow. years, Rob. I called, I wrote letters, I sent emails, I begged, I pleaded, but they never made a penny off any of those yeah. songs that they're on in all those years. And that stuff has never been out of print in the last 57 years. And you can understand why like, it would be so difficult for them to do this because... Yeah. Shit. 
The only money money they ever made was when they did a live show and Coxon gave them three pounds to buy a dress. <laughs> So they were very bitter, and they really didn't want to talk to anybody. But my my friends at WBAI, the Pacifica station in New York City, the, the Midnight Ravers, um, arranged for me in 2003 to finally meet uh, Beverly. Uh, and she came down from the Bronx, and uh, they flew um, Cherry Green, whose real name is Ermine Bramwell, up from Florida and I did about nine hours of interviews with them, and they're finally they finally got to tell their story. And shortly after, uh, Cherry died. So thank God I got to them in time, because they're a, a really important piece of the mm -hmm. early whalers' foundation struggles. And they knew things that a lot of other people didn't know. They they knew the female side of it and. Bob's right. problem was with Rita right from the start. In fact, in 19, I think it was 66, uh, Rita was already trying to find a way to divorce Bob. And I don't think that was known before the book. With my book, I, I tried to sprinkle on almost every single page some kind of factoid that hadn't been publicly disclosed before. Because I had over 110 interviews over the past well, let's see, I started the interviews in 1979. I signed the contract for the book in 2002. The book came out in 2017, <laughs> finally. And uh, so that's a, a, a lot of material to, to absorb. It ended up hmm. using 75 of the people's interviews and Bob um, and, and told a, a very different story of Bob's life. Uh, one of the things I... I loved most was there, there's a remarkably eloquent poet and professor uh, named Kwame Dawes who wrote a wonderful book about Bob's Island material called Bob Marley Lyrical Genius. And when we sent him the uh, galleys to the book, he wrote back and said, this book is a triumph of the storytelling virtuosity of Jamaican people. And I love that because so much of what is out there is kind of, I got to be careful here. You know, like Timothy White made up all kinds of conversations between Bob and Rita, bedroom talk, pillow talk, and stuff like that, that he couldn't possibly have known. And right. it, it reads more like a book of fiction than, than a book of facts. And I wanted to counteract that. I wanted people who were there in the room when these things happened to have that story told. And thus, this book is filled with contradictions. Yes. And, uh, you know, I wasn't there. Rob, you weren't there. Yeah. So uh, let's put their things in print for future historians. My original concept of the book was very different. I had, you know, as I say, about 110 interviews. And I wanted it to be the raw transcripts of each of those interviews. Right. Uh, for I wanted it to be the raw material for historians. And eventually all that stuff will be in a museum in Jamaica, I hope. And, you know, scholars in the, in the future will have it. But... Um, the editor who originally uh, contracted the book, Jim Mars at Norton, uh, passed uh, while I was writing mm -hmm. the book. And um, as luck would have it, uh, who succeeded him was a young man named Tom Mayer, who used to have a ska band in New York. And was a, I was on KCRW in yeah. Los Angeles, and he was on WKCR at Columbia University doing a reggae radio show. So he really knew the topic, and he just ripped the book apart. I, I, my original concept that I sent them finally, after a computer crash took everything, took me years to recover from that, um, I sent him 800 pages in nine chapters. <laughs> and he was a <laughs> And he turned it into 400 pages and 35 chapters of bathroom length material and turned it into a, a book that has garnered some pretty nice reviews over the years. Rolling Stone said that of the 700 Bob Marley books that are out there, uh, this book might be the best Bob Marley book ever. That was the headline of their review in Rolling Stone. 
Well, and, 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 and what I think is so wonderful about this book is in how it's like, much like your, your archive, which I'd like to talk about, it, it's meticulously curated, right? I mean, just the way that you've, like the amount of detail that you've put into telling something as authentic as possible, hence the contradictions. I mean, you have everybody's voice. Um, the other piece is with Bunny Whaler, uh, now, now that he's, you know, he's, he's moved on, is you were working on that book uh, with him and, and how you, you had a, a hotel room for a week with him, but it three never weeks. came for three weeks. Three weeks locked in a hotel room in Kingston with Bunny Whaler and my partner, Leroy Pearson. You got to tell me how that was. Yeah. Oh, that was everything you can imagine and more. You know? <laughs> right. Was, there was a lot of smoking going on. <laughs> and, um, you know, he asked me in uh, 1989 um, if I would co-write his autobiography with him. And I was very honored, you know, because... Yeah. I, I was told for a long time that he didn't like white people that much, but you know, in all my connections with him, he saw how serious I was, and he read a lot of my writing about the Whalers in the Beat magazine, which C. C. Smith and I started. And um, I I wanted to have Leroy Pearson uh, write it with me because Leroy's a musician, right. and I'm not. So he would think of all kinds of questions to ask that I never would have even thought of, and it gave it a balance. So Bunny had worked with him already on his Night uh, Leroy's Nighthawk label, and they released some of his material there. So Bunny was amenable to that. And we, we stayed in the hotel in Kingston for three weeks, and virtually every day Bunny would come by. Um, one day it was 14 hours, and he didn't eat anything the whole 14 hours. He just drank water. And he unburdened himself of all these things he wanted the world to know and uh, told us the whole history of his life with Bob from the time they were little boys together in Nine Mile up in the mountains. And his father moved in with Bob's mother or vice versa. Right. <laughs> and um, it went all the way through Blackheart Man, through the end of the Whalers as a trio and Bunny's first solo album. And it came to 1,800 pages of transcriptions. Wow. It's in a huge box at my feet here right now. And we eventually got everything transcribed. It took us most of the 90s because we were doing it for free. We were doing it, you know, in our own time. We both had, you know, livelihoods to make, support our families. And at the end of uh, the 90s, we, Leroy and I sent him three completed chapters about Bob's exile in Nine Mile after he came back from the States in 66, about Bunny's imprisonment during that period, and uh, about the birth of Whale and Solem. And um, he didn't respond. He didn't return my phone calls. And this went on for two years, and I didn't know what was happening. And finally, uh, at one of our Bob Marley days at the turn of the century, his band leader, Carl Aiton, Aiton pulled me aside and said, you know, Bunny's not going to publish that book. Bunny's not going to finish that book. He's too afraid of, of the Marleys. He's afraid he'll get the Marleys angry at him when he tells a lot of stories that they don't want heard. And I finally got him on the phone after two years, and I said, well, what did you think of the chapters? We can't finish this book if, this, if you don't approve of the way we're going at it. Because he might have talked about um, the first Coxon sessions 20 different times during those three weeks, so he had to synthesize all those different parts of the transcripts and then turn it into Bunny's voice but because there was a lot of patois in our conversations, we couldn't do that for an international audience. We'd just lose them. So we had to find a way of, of making it intelligible to people and available to translators. And um, so we needed his approval on these three chapters as the way for the book to be finished. And he said, well, I never read them. I said, you've been sitting on these for two years and you never read them? He says, yeah, why don't you come to Miami and read them to me? 
I said, what are you, five years old, Bunny? Come on, man. So the the project was aborted, much oh. to our chagrin. And now, you know, I'm so angry at all the things I've learned about him in recent years and all the people he's ripped off and disappointed and making songs in praise of Dudas and praise of the head of the shower posse who directly or indirectly killed thousands of people. And he's making praise songs of, for this guy. Don't touch the president. That's like Bruce Springsteen making praise songs for John Gotti. Right. You know? Right. So something happened to him in this century, and he turned into somebody very different. And I, I have no desire to spend any time in, in Bunny's mind anymore. It's a real shame, and, but history will have it. That's right. my only recompense. And 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 I do think that um, going back to Bob Marley, that there was just something about him that was incorruptible. Wow, that's a good question, Rob. Boy, it depends on how you define incorruptible. <laughs> yeah, I said privately that Bob was very very lucky to die when he did. I think had he lived even a couple of years longer, there would have been information that you'd rather not know. There were a lot of bad people coming around him. He, he came out of a, a very bad part of town. And there was no escaping the evil forces in that part of town. And they were certainly glomming on to Bob Marley in many different ways. So, yeah, that's all I want to say on that. Well, because he was 36 when he passed away. And he predicted that when he was 24. I've talked to three people who confirmed that. Um, he was living with his mother in Delaware in the summer of 1969 at Woodstock summer. And he actually made jewelry to sell at Woodstock. Yes. Yeah. And um, he uh, he was talking to Dion Wilson and Ibis Pitts, a couple of young friends of his, and they were telling him, "Oh man, you know, you're going to be famous. You're going to have all kinds of hits, and you're going to live a long life, and have lots of kids, and get very rich, and you're going to be a superstar, Bob." And Bob just shook his head and he said, "No, man. He says when I'm 36, I'm going to die." And they were so surprised by what he said, because he was 24 at the time, right? that they went to his mother and told his mother what he had told them. And she confirmed that to me. I have her on video confirming that. So that's three different people. I've talked to Ibis and Dion, and they both confirmed it too. So I believe that's right. And that just proves that Bob was a psychic. Right. And there are lots of stories in the book, as you've read, where, where his psychic things impressed other people too. Uh, from the time he was like three and a half years of age and he was reading people's palms in the village of Nine Mile and telling them intimate details of their life, freaking them out. And they went to talk to his mother and say, hey, keep an eye on this kid. There's something going on here. Yeah. Well, and, and, and he did have a very, you know, rough childhood upbringing. I mean, his father, he never, he never, never really. his father and his father never really cared to know him. Apparently he he moved he moved out with his father, but then ended up on the street or something like that. Well, the, the father abandoned him. And, right. Um, and when he was about five, he showed up at Nine Mile and he said to Bob's mother, "Give me the kid. I'll take him to Kingston and we'll give him a shot at a better life, and I'll I'll enroll him in a good school there." And instead, he took him to Kingston and he sent him to live with an old woman who was infirm. And Bob, from the ages of five to seven, was basically an abandoned child on the streets of Kingston, fending not only for himself, but for this old woman. And that was a, a major formative piece of his life. And in that documentary that was made several years ago called Marley, they never even mentioned that. Hmm. Never mentioned that. And that gave him his his empathy for the sufferers, 
for people in the ghetto who are starving through no fault of their own, through an accident of birth. And that informed his work for the rest of his life. Well, at, at one point, he was paying for 6,000 people a month or something. I think it could be as high as that. And I got that from his business manager, um, Colin Leslie, who's a dear friend. And Colin had to co-sign the checks or they weren't valid. So, right. you know, not even Don Taylor, the manager, uh, knew exactly what Bob was doing with his money and how much of that money it was. It was almost all the money he made in his lifetime. He And he, uh, you know, it's it said that he supported 4,000 people a month, but uh, Colin said it was much, much more than that. Wow. And people would come to him with all kinds of wacky ideas, you know. There were everybody who knew him told stories about the long lines of people waiting to come into his headquarters at 56 Hope Road, a tough gong, uh, begging money for various projects. And one day, uh, Colin is sitting there with the checkbook next to Bob, and guy comes in and he said, uh, I, I want to start a, a coconut oil company. <laughs> And Bob wrote him a big check right away. And when he left, Colin said, Bob, why did you do that? And Bob says, oh, Colin, I've always wanted to be in the <laughs> oil business. <laughs> well, he, there, there's so many stories about Bob and sort of into his wisdom, how he thinks. And I've often wondered, like, is, is, he, is he joking or is he serious? Like, he seemed quite satirical in his own way. Uh, you're mentioning the time that you you guys drove by Ronald Reagan's house, and he made some some in, funny comment about Nixon. That. Nixon, sorry. Nixon uh, retired after he was forced to resign to San Clemente on the coast of California, uh, right on the edge of the water. And there's a big heliport there. There were huge international, intercontinental uh, signal towers on the property. And as we were driving to San Diego in uh, 79 on the bus with Bob, um, I pointed out over on the bluff, Bob, look over there. That's that's Nixon's house. And Bob looks up at me and he says, what year him president? <laughs> I said, hey, man, more than a year, long enough to do some serious damage. <laughs> yeah. Right. What year him president? <laughs> So what what was it like knowing Bob like in in your capacity because you were with him quite extensively on the survival tour? I had two weeks with him. Yeah, I had met yeah. him the previous year, but he was so stoned I couldn't even get into a conversation. Right, with Santa Cruz. But in '79, uh, my partner Hank Holmes and I had the only reggae radio show in L.A. And so Island Records called us and asked us if we would mind going on the road for two weeks with Bob Marley. <laughs> <Twist the arm. laughs> yeah. And, um, so we, we were able to spend the better part of two weeks with him uh, in all kinds of situations, public and private. And, you know, he, he was a quiet guy. He, he was a watcher. He was a listener. He didn't, he wasn't much into small talk. Mm. Um, he always wanted to know what what you thought, where your head was. Do you believe in a God? You know, have you studied Rastafari? And I, I, I remember a story that um, um, one, of the, one of the Wailing Souls uh, told me. And uh, he, um, Bob had been on tour in 76 and he came back to Jamaica at the end of the tour. And... Uh, um, why am I blanking his name? He's a good friend. I get brain farts every once in a while. Um, anyway, the, 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 the Wailing Soul guy went up to Bob and uh, Bob said, hey man, how, how you doing? What you been up to? And, and he said, oh, nothing much, Bob, just chilling. And Bob said, in these times? Always shaking people up. Yeah. Garth Dennis, Garthy, Garth Dennis. Yeah, his kids are a uh, group now, the uh, Us Mob. And um, he, he's a very serious guy himself, too. You know, the Wailing Souls mm -hmm. sounded a lot like the Wailers because they were both tr trained in the same yard by Joe Higgs, the great hero of the Wailers story who goes unacknowledged far too often. Yes, because Joe Higgs, 
in Dream. your book, he's sort of like a coach. He's like a oh, he is even like a father figure to Bob Marley. I sort of was picking up on. Yeah, yeah, because he was older. He was one of the first reggae stars, and um, a mutual friend, a guy named Errol, paid him to tutor Bob, mm -hmm. beginning when Bob was about fourteen years of age, and um, Joe. Uh, Love jazz, and he and Seiko, who became the Whalers percussionist, uh, were were jazz heads. So Bob had uh, an early influence of jazz, and Joe taught him mic technique, taught him composition because he was a composer as well as a performer. Um, taught him how to breathe, hmm. gave him a, a tremendous basis for his future career. And he, he did that willingly and lovingly. And Bob did not always treat him uh, the way he should have been treated, as you saw in the book, when he uh, replaced Bunny Whaler in the fall of 1973. And Bob never even paid him for that tour. Hmm. He had to pretend that he had gone mad to get Bob to even listen to him. And Bob ended up you know, giving him a small amount of money for his work on that tour. I mean, it, it just goes to show, like, uh, again, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, title of the show, right? But there's sort of two kind of ideas of Bob Marley. Like, I have this almost comparable to uh, Jesus, you know. That's sort of my understanding is even in uh, uh, Michael Manley and the, 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 the One Love concert in Jamaica, the free concert, when he held their hands together, that was sort of like Jesus between the two thieves. Yeah, I have, I have, I have this idea of Bob Marley, but then there's also that he was a human. Okay. You know, he was a, he was he was complex like we all are. You know, I've never met a perfect person. He wasn't a saint, but so very much of what he did in his life yes. was saintly. Yes. So much help to so many people without looking for any praise or recompense himself. Uh, he That's why he was so blown away when, when he got shot, because it was people he had been helping who came to shoot him. It just didn't make any sense to him that people could, could act like that. It broke his heart. Well, when that... Actually, let's talk about that, that very important part, too, when he was shot before the concert. And, and there's some speculation over who was orchestrating that. And we know at this time, this is a very, uh, you know, so many proxy battles were going on at the cold war that there's very, you know, evident reason to believe that this was funded by the CIA. Are you able to? to no, to, no, there's no proof of that whatsoever. None. There's no proof, but that was one. I, certain I have theory. been called a CIA agent myself because I say that, mm. you know, and I hate the CIA. I hate everything right. it's done. I hate everything it stands for. It was a corrupted organization of warmongering people. And if I could find, you know, I've been studying, researching Bob Marley since 1973. I've written seven books about him. And I have never found any direct link between the CIA and the assassination attempt at the Smile Jamaica affair in 19. Uh, at 76. And I'll tell you something else. Years ago, I worked with a brilliant director uh, from England named Jeremy Marr, who made the Rebel Music documentary and Roots Rock Reggae, best mm -hmm. film ever about reggae. And when he was doing Rebel Music, he went to interview Philip Agee. And Philip Agee was a renegade CIA agent who had been assigned, among other countries, to Jamaica in the 70s. Mm. And when I first went to Jamaica with my wife Mary in 1976, we arrived the week that Prime Minister Michael Manley, the socialist Prime Minister, declared a national state of emergency because he said there was an imminent invasion of Jamaica about to take place. And a lot of people poo-pooed that. Well, when Jeremy Marr went to Havana, where uh, Philip Agee, the renegade CIA agent, had taken uh, his exile under the protection of Castro and opened a travel agency in Havana, 
He, uh, Jeremy interviewed Philip, and Philip said when he was stationed in Jamaica, he went through all their files trying to find out if they were in any way involved in the assassination attempt, and he could find absolutely nothing, mm. and that no one there said that the CIA had been involved either. Now, that's that's proof enough for me, because this right. guy, if he had found anything, he would have been writing a book about it. Yeah. He would have told the whole damn world about it. Yeah. What happened, I think, there's no question it was right-wing forces of Edward Siaga. There were at least five people led by uh, Jim Brown, who was one of the chief enforcers for the JLP, the Jamaica Labor Party of Edward Siaga. Um, Siaga, in that Netflix documentary, Who Shot Bob Marley, uh, just, filmed just before Siaga died, basically said he always had at least two layers of insulation between him and activities so that mm -hmm. nothing could be directly traced to him. So Siaga may be giving a word to somebody who gave the word to Jim Brown. That might have caused it to happen. But I doubt, I doubt the CIA was involved. Right. And I'm not a CIA lover at all. And anybody who claims I'm a CIA stooge is a goddamn liar. <laughs> so, so it was an inside job, and like within uh, Ciega's sort of yeah. affiliation. Yeah. After that, Bob Marley he does his concert, and then he leaves for for London, and that's when Exodus is written. Correct. Right. And and Kaya. And Kaya at simultaneously, right? Yeah. And, and and very obviously uniquely different albums. Um, which actually I want to talk about that in a second. But then after this this shooting, the gang members on both sides kind of realize, hold on, we're just being pitted against each other. And the gang leaders of Jamaica, they fly out to see Bob in London. Representatives of, of both gangs, yeah. And um Bob didn't want to go back, he was too afraid. But they, they guaranteed him that he would have safe passage. And eventually he came around and, and went back at the end of February of 78. He was gone for about 14 and a half months. And, um, yeah, the, the One Love Peace concert was a noble attempt to bring peace to the ghetto. And the following year when I interviewed Peter Tosh for the first time, I said, has anything changed since the so-called peace? And he says, yeah, more dead. Oh. Yeah. So it didn't really hold. Yeah. And, and that was, you know, it's so did Bob Marley ever, like, do you think he ever knew he would impact the world in such a global way? Because he was so, he so wanted to help his, his own country people. Well, when you go to a foreign country where very few people speak English and you draw 110,000 people to a stadium yeah. singing along with you, you've got to realize that you've got an impact on people. Right. You've got to. And I, that was a, a tremendous burden for him. But, you know, people like Mortimer Planner, his early Rasta consultant, um, told him that, that he had been chosen, that he was the person to bring Rasta to the rest of the world. And, and that was his mission. Every time he was asked what, what his purpose in life was, and it was to alert the world to the divinity of, of Haile Selassie. Um, he didn't turn a Jesus freak at the end of his life. He did get baptized in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church but he never renounced Rastafari during his lifetime. And um, he wanted the whole world to wake up to the fact that God was incarnated in our own lifetime in the body of a living man, almighty God is a living man, he sang. And by that he meant Rastafari and he wanted the world to accept that fact. That was his goal. His other major goal was to reach the African-American audience, which was impervious to him. 
in the 70s. They were all into glam stuff and sly in the stone, and they didn't want to see some guy in dungarees singing in Patois about going back to Africa. Mm. <laughs> they didn't want to go back to a mud hut. They wanted to go out and live in the suburbs. Right. And and, and that's another thing that, what like, what does in our day and age, because, you know, times are, I mean, look around us. It's scary. You know, Bob, Bob mentioned that uh, you mentioned earlier how that person said, you know, I'm just chilling and he's chilling in times like these. And I do think that again, the one love message is so powerful. It's, you know, now, now more than ever, I think it's the, the only answer. It's the only real solution to the problems that we're seeing today. And I mean, I know that that sounds incredibly idealistic, but that is what I believe is, you know, the, the power of one love. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. Uh, are you still teaching? You said you taught seventh grade at one point. I'm a, uh, I'm a uh, elementary school counselor. So I work with mental health. And, and again, that's why Rastafari and, and, and reggae, like you say, it's these vibrations. We're pulled into them and it's healing. Yeah. Right. Uh, Dance you know. to jaw music, Bob said. Dance yeah. to music that elevates. Dance, yeah. look, dance to music that increases your consciousness and the awareness that we're all one. I wish I, Bob had dropped acid. I, I think Bob was <laughs> uh, gotten an awful lot out of an acid trip, but well, he, he didn't like anything but herb. But you talk about that that jug that he had, and the one the one band member drank it, and he was yeah. just like incapacitated. <laughs> yeah, he almost collapsed <laughs> on stage. Dave, but that was that was her. Well, who knows what it was? It was a right. special concoction that uh, Gilly, his his uh, cook, had made up for him, and God knows what it had in it. But Bob could take slugs of it and seem nonplussed and here's this huge guy who could have been a football <laughs> player you know who took one little drink and was out of his mind for hours <laughs> so his cook his cook made this for him bob marley's cook yeah. and he's never disclosed what it was no wow gilly's still around I, I, next time i see him I, I must ask him he told me about the Spanish moss and the other kind of traditional Jamaican foods that he made for Bob, but he never told me about that special drink. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yes, again, Bob Marley, his music and, and, you know, how it translates today, the way that we consume music is very different. You know, with Spotify, I just say to Google, play this song, whereas there is something to be said and this ties into your archives about the mindfulness in putting on music. Yeah, and, and how do you autograph a download? <laughs> right. <laughs> right? You know, I say about 40% of all my records are autographed. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that won't happen again. So, so tell us what you think about how music is consumed. Is that... Oh, you know, it, 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 the seven rooms of my reggae archives mm. could fit on a thumb drive. Yeah. And that's so depressing. When you lose the tactility of something, right? the there is there of it, uh, you've lost something that can't be replaced. Right. And you don't have that respect for it either. You know, you can you can punch a, a couple of numbers into your iPhone, and you can pick up any record that's ever been made in history, practically. Hmm. Where's the fun in that? Where where's the the joy? You know, I like things. This generation doesn't respect things hmm. yeah. because there's a difference between mindfully owning something and just being a consumer. Yeah, yeah, I, I I don't have things for the sake of having things. No. I have things that I think deserve to be preserved for people in centuries to come, if God help us, we survive this century. And um, they're they're chosen. I you know I don't keep everything that's sent to me. 
some things, you know, there's a lot of slackness in, in the music now that I really despise. So it doesn't appeal to me at all. I don't want that stuff. My, my collection is the history of roots reggae music. And that's a Rastafarian inspired music. And that's, that's what I want to preserve. Um, my long-term goal for decades has been to have a museum in Jamaica so mm -hmm. that Jamaican people will understand the broad international effect and reach of their music because they're terribly naive about it. Mm. And, um, you know, they, they don't even like the British reggae bands in Jamaica. You, you don't get a lot of Steel Pulse or Black Uhuru, not Black Uhuru, but... Uh, um, that's the other band I'm thinking of, Aswad, um, in, in Jamaica. They don't get much airplay, and then the African artists get none. Um, mm. it, it, it's really odd. Because what you're describing is, uh, is uh, almost like a one-way globalization, like Bob Marley International, right? And it's, whew, but it seems like nothing is coming into Jamaica is kind of what you're describing. Yeah, yeah, and that's still true. What, why do you think that that is? Insularity. Mm. It's our music. What are they doing with it? But yet it's the international artists who are keeping it alive. You know, it's, it's still big in Europe, and that's because there's so many European reggae bands that are helping keep it alive. And, and you're speaking of roots reggae, not necessarily... Yeah. Yeah, obviously that's... dance hall right which which the two are you know are not one and the same obviously yeah yeah what about are, are you familiar with uh capleton capleton thank you capleton they... yeah you know he made a lot of real anti-homosexual songs and mm. ruined it for an awful lot of people uh, because they the roots artists got painted with this same brush you know oh they make all these anti-gay and anti-women songs, these Jamaicans. Well, some Jamaicans do, but not the roots reggae artists, not the people who are taking you to a higher place. And they're not preaching hate. Mm. But a lot of a lot of the artists in the 90s lost gigs because the promoters didn't want to be associated with that kind of music. Right. Yeah, it's really a shame. That's that's when the forward moment momentum of reggae. Uh, almost came to a halt would you say like who would you say is a good uh example today of an artist creating new music that that follows the the roots reggae kabaka pyramid protege john nine chronics mm. there are a lot of youngsters but they they facing so many odds because how do you reinvent the wheel rob right you know, all the great major artists of the 60s and 70s and early 80s have made the most profound statements about the basic beliefs of Rastafari. Mm. And you're just repeating it for a new generation. And every generation needs their own spokespersons and uh, their own heroes. And I don't I don't see that gaining as much traction as it should. Right. Right. Well, and, and, and I think again, that ties into sort of how we consume music. So yeah. much of, of contemporary artists, I don't have any interest in. And again, I Rastafari kind of speaks to what is the intention of the music that's being created today. And so much of it is kind of commercialized, commercialized. Whereas Bob Marley, when, when he first started out, I mean, he, of the group, he was the most raw, it sounds like he was, he was almost in his singing. He was, he was like uncontrolled, but he was raw and he was powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it was honest. It was yeah. Straight from his soul onto wax. Yeah. And that's sort of what, again, you know, we talk about what are the, the the fundamental sort of beliefs of Rastafari, and one is to be completely real. It's not a, it's the antithesis of hate. It what, is. What else does Rastafari teach us? To respect the planet. Mm. They are ecologists. Um, 
the the unification of all humankind love as the overarching principle uh, it, it reminds me of what uh, a huge marley fan uh, carlos santana is and he's been a friend for a long time and he says before you do anything in life you must always ask yourself this question how is this going to make the world a better place? And I think that's one of the basic questions that a Rastafarian would ask. How do I do no harm, but let no harm come to me? You often hear Rasta say that. How can I do no harm and let no harm come to me? Yeah. And I think that that's the key to happiness. Yeah. What does what does Rastafari say about mental health? I mean, with COVID-19, the way that the world is right now, there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of anxiety. What does what does it say about that? Eat a natural <laughs> lifestyle. Mm. Um, don't eat meat. Um, the purest Rastafarians, Rob, the ones who live up in the hills, you never see them. They won't even eat a piece of fruit mm. unless it's already fallen off the tree. They won't even pick it. Wow. It has, has to be freely given. And yeah, it it's hard to live up to. Those principles are very hard to live up to, but they would create a far better world. Yeah. You may say, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> right. And, and, and oh, man, like, because in, in its essence, that is like, it's what so many religions do teach us is to be present in this moment, but they're purely in this moment in a sense that they won't even let their actions affect nature by pulling the fruit off the tree yeah and and our society i mean like you say if we're still here in a hundred years the way that we're going is so against nature and my understanding of rastafari is with nature absolutely, absolutely. and that is that is what we can we can pull from this and so i kind of want to change the 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 direction to to now you and how you got into this and how you're still so incredibly passionate about reggae rastafari roots reggae rastafari bob marley i mean you have dedicated your life to this and i think that's part of it i mean we associate reggae obviously with i mean things such as black lives matter and i mean you we're white people talking about this being aware of that. Yeah. Well, you know, Rasta doesn't see color, supposedly. It is uh, mainly geared toward black people who want rep repatriation to the motherland. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, it's about all people. And Bob was a future person. Bob's father was white. And uh, there's no way we're going to have peace on earth if we're going to have racism and racial wars. and. Right. Uh, all the things that are destroying the planet right now. Yeah. And there's, there's that one love. So your story and how it sounds like reggae has played a part. Obviously reggae has played a part in your journey and in your healing. You think? <laughs> yeah. So you, you were in the Viet, in the Vietnam war. Are you okay to sort of share your experiences during yeah. the 60s and sure. the 70s. Yeah, that's my new book, the next book I'm working on with my daughter, Kate, who runs our Family Acid uh, Instagram, The Family Acid. Um, she called it that, she said, because when she was growing up, her friends told her our family was like the Waltons on acid. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. And it's 50 years of my uh, film photography. Uh, and, and it began in, in Vietnam because I've always had a keen sense of history. And as soon as I got to Saigon in early November 1967, 
I bought a camera at the PX and started documenting what I was seeing. And um, three months later, the Tet Offensive tore the country apart. And a lot of Saigon went up in flames. And uh, they, a few months later, in the renewed offensive in May, they dropped three rockets on my block and burned it to the ground. And during the, the first Tet Offensive, February of 68, they, there were 52 families living in sewer pipes on the street in front of my barracks. Huge, huge sewer pipes that hadn't been laid underground yet. And every morning I'd, I'd walk across the street to the compound of the PSYOPs group that I was assigned to, and there'd be bodies on the sidewalk, dead people. And I, I used, as I said earlier, I used to read poetry for a living. I had a one-man show called Poetry for People Who Hate Poetry, and I did it primarily in the Midwest. And there were places where a lot of people knew me. Uh, one of them was Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, about 20 miles south of Milwaukee on uh, Lake Michigan. And I, I played at all the schools in town two or three times. So I wrote a letter to the editor of the local newspaper, and I said, these people desperately need food, clothing, medicine, anything you could send, I guarantee you I will personally distribute so that it doesn't end up on the black market. I give you my word that I will see that it goes to the people most in need, beginning with the people in the sewer pipes out in front of my building. Right. And uh, they published an editorial in the Racine Journal Times and my letter to the editor, urging support from the school kids who remembered me as the poet. And Three weeks later, two five-ton trucks pulled into the compound with my mail. These huge nine-foot-tall steel connexes, those international shipping containers, wow. filled to the brim with little packages all addressed to me. And to make a long story short, I, I was assigned as the colonel's typist. And... I went in and I said, Colonel, there's something outside you got to see. And he says, Private Steffens, I'm very busy. I said, no, sir, you got to see this. So he goes outside and there's packages pouring out of the steel connexes. He said, what the hell's that? And I said, well, it's my mail, sir. And I think it's, you know, refugee supplies that my friends have sent me. And I got to send it all back because I'm so busy typing your letters all day, I, I don't have time to distribute this. And I promised my friends I would personally distribute it. I don't want it to end up on the black market. Come into my office, Stevens. He promoted me to spec four on the spot, gave me my own Quonset hut, told me I could go anywhere in the country from the DMZ to the Delta and work on any project I thought worthwhile as long as I took pictures. So I learned to be a photographer and I had free film and developing for the next two years. And I took full advantage of that. I, uh, I shot over 10,000 frames and uh, learned an awful lot about that country. I got to more places in Vietnam than I think almost anybody who ever went there had and worked on a wide variety of medical and dental and uh, housing projects and built villages and then rebuilt the village after it had got burned out. And I extended uh, 14 more months so I could get an early out. And I was there a total of 26 months. Never fired a shot. Not one. Thank God. And I came back in 70 and I lectured against the war for a year all over the country. And I didn't want to be an American anymore. I felt like I did for the past four years with the former guy in office. And mm -hmm. uh, I ended up living in Marrakesh for almost a year in the Medina. Learned I was an American. <laughs> Came home. <laughs> I'll tell you, I, I absolutely believe this is true. If, if Canada had had a better climate, I would have become a Canadian citizen in 1970 after the war. I was so embarrassed to be an American. 
what what did it mean to you when you were in Medina to be an American? Because you said you learned what that meant. Well, you know, a lot of people wanted to talk to me about Vietnam. And I certainly wasn't promoting the American position in Vietnam. And I just wanted to know, people to know that not all Americans approved of that. And that to me, as a Vietnam veteran, my heroes were the people who went to Canada, who went to Sweden and refused to fight in an illegal and immoral war. Mm. And I think that was part of my job when I was an expat. So you're dis you were discharged in 1970. I got out of the army on uh, December 7th, 1969, the week of Altamont. Almost got to Altamont, but the highway turned it into a parking lot about seven miles short of the place, and I didn't feel like walking seven miles. And we turned around at the last possible moment before we would have been stuck in that impenetrable traffic. And there's a lot of pictures of that uh, on uh, on the Family Acid Instagram. Are you able to explain the significance of the of Altima, 1969? Was that was? Oh that yeah, the... I mean the popular conception of it is absolutely right. It was the end of hippie. It, mm. it killed all the dreams of uh, of Woodstock, and it was just the worst forces all coming together in one place: bad drugs, hell's angels. You know, just the the dream of a generation in love with itself died at Altima, and it was never the same after. Because that, in that in Kent State and Jackson State, the murders at those right. two places, that that killed the the movement. That was the end of it. Because because the nineteen sixties were this very optimistic period. Again, in sort of the counterculture, there was the hippie movement. Yeah, but then. Yes, in 1969, uh, 1970s, there's a huge pushback on that. And then we see it even more in 1980s and Giuliani's New York, right? We see so much of this uh, crackdown on, on progress. Mm -hmm. Do you see that there's a resurgence in that movement, the counterculture today? Oh, absolutely. And the Black yeah. Lives Matter movement is so crucially important. We hadn't seen massive intercontinental demonstrations as we had since George Floyd's death. That's a very, very positive thing. And, and culture is changing so rapidly, maybe going a little too far to the left with the cancel culture and lack of forgiveness. But uh, I think in the long run, that arc that MLK talked about is, is true. And um, we we are facing existential questions that have to be addressed, and if they're not, we're not going to have grandchildren. There won't mm -hmm. be any place for them. My own kids don't want kids, which breaks my heart. But they don't want to bring a kid into this world. Yeah. And, and 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 that's part of why I started this show. I'm probably wrong about everything, and and so much of what we've talked about ties into the solution. Is that you know. <sighs> As long as there's a left, there's going to be a right, you know, and, and as, as, as one side goes more extreme, the other side will go more extreme in terms of cancel culture and them, you know, hatred begetting hatred. And that's why Rastafari, honestly, and, and the music of Bob Marley to me is the solution. One love, right. You know, uh, I like the way you think, Rob. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, that's why I want to have you on here because to me, none of this is inseparable, you know, and your, and, and your book tells us, you know, I mean, it details uh, um, that, that one man who, to me, I kind of deify, you know, there are similarities between us and that every person is significant, just like the Rastafari to teach us and tell us. So that's where you kind of got your answers were from, because it sounds like, 1969 you're discharged uh, or you're, you're discharged you, you see the crumbling of a very optimistic period and throughout your life you've had these amazing challenges i mean this book again so extensive in its research you lost it initially and you're in a slump for like two years you're sharing so when ultima happened and you saw the crumbling how were you in your state of being 
Well, I'd been out of the country for almost two and a half years mm -hmm. at the heart of what everybody in the world was talking about, <laughs> living in Saigon. And um, it, it was a, a wonderful relief to get home. Um, but it wasn't the country that I wanted it to be. Right. The fact that, you know, in 72, Nixon got reelected. Good mm -hmm. God. And Kissinger was bombing Hanoi, and, and they ended up with a settlement that he could have had four years earlier. It was just disgusting. Mm -hmm. It was... So you, you sought out other people who felt the way you did, I was living in Berkeley when we, I got back from Marrakesh, and I, I hung out with a, a lot of the people who were early writers and editors at Rolling Stone magazine, because it was still headquartered in San Francisco then. And then I got divorced in 73 from the war correspondent I had met on the island of the Coconut Monk. And uh, Tim Page, who I had been hearing about so much while I was in Vietnam and almost met there, except the day we were scheduled to meet, he got blown up for the fourth time and left for dead on a battlefield. Um, he, um, he was recovering from these terrible injuries and we met, I guess it was about a month after I got divorced and he moved in with me in Berkeley. And he's the guy that Dennis Hopper played in Apocalypse Now. Hmm. Whoa. That guy. And he was a, a fantastic photographer. I learned so much about photography from him. And he was an acid head like I was. And we had two bachelor years together in Berkeley that were uh -oh. unspeakably <laughs> Are you sorry? Are you going to detail that in your? No. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Take it to the grave. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are a lot of pictures on on the site uh, on on the family acid. Yes. And then recently, I uh, my daughter edited our latest family acid book. This is our third one. We've got a. San Francisco zine too, but this is the family acid California and it's got all kinds of acidic visions in here. Let me see. It's, it's the, it's the double, uh, I don't know much about photography, but it's like two pictures double over exposure. double so exposure. Yeah. Let me see if I can get this right. There we are. There's Tim Page and me the day I met my wife, Mary on an acid trip celebrating his birthday in Mendocino in a pygmy forest under a total eclipse of the moon, as one does. And Mary wow. and I have been together since that day. And there were all kinds of, you know, fascinating people in our lives. Mm. This is uh, Tom Steinbeck, who was a friend of mine in Vietnam. He directed my TV show, Reading Poetry to the Combat Troops. And that was in 1973 in Berkeley. And uh, he was... I spent a lot of time with him after the war, too. He lived with me in Racine for a while. See what else I can find in here. A couple of good double exposures. And these are these are double exposures of my mm. wife and me and, and uh, Big Sur. And that's uh, in Mendocino with the Redwood Alien. Right. <laughs> yeah. I, I well, love I love double exposures. There's another one. That's Big Sur. Yeah, some some of them on the Family Acid webpage are, oh, yeah. or on the on the Instagram are oh, so yeah. a ton of them. <laughs> oh, so poetic, right? Thank you. So you 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 have these these experiences. You know, you drop acid, ganja. Why are these things legal? Because it <laughs> sounds like. There we go. Wow. That's a har at the harmonic convergence back in the mid 80s when all the planets lined up. Oh, that would have been trippy. Oh, it was. <laughs> <laughs> have you ever done acid? Uh, well, I, I don't know if I can say uh, on this show, but. Oh, you're uh, teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've heard, I'll let you read it. You've heard about it. I've heard. I've, I've heard it can be quite an experience. Yes. 
Timothy Leary was a friend of mine, you know. Man, okay, so honestly, Roger, your life just, uh, uh, like, what has it been like to live your life? Do you ever just, like, shake your head and go, how has this happened? I know, I do. <laughs> I mean, I was born in Brooklyn. Right. Uh, Irish Catholic kid, went out to Jersey when I was nine in 1951 and raised basically a suburban kid but always gravitated into the city, which was 15 minutes away. And um, I loved rock and roll, first generation rock and roll. I, 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 I met my hero, Alan Freed, several times when I was a kid. I once told him I wanted to be Alan Freed when I grew up. And uh, I've been called the Alan Freed of reggae, so that, that kind of happened. Yeah. Uh, but I've been an actor all my life, a broadcaster, a writer. So I, I've come in contact with a lot of well-known people. And luckily enough, I've become friendly with some of them. And, um, you know, I, I, it was a life that a suburban kid from New Jersey could never in a million years have predicted. Yes. <laughs> you know, all the people that I've, I've been lucky enough to, to know and love and hang out with and sometimes even do acid with. Uh, Waldo Salt was a mentor of mine. Waldo wrote Midnight Cowboy and Coming Home, but he also wrote uh, Day of the Locust and Serpico. And in his earlier years, he wrote um, Hollywood blockbusters and uh, the first two drafts of Philadelphia Story back in the 30s. And he, he wrote uh, uh, Crimson Pirate and Taris Bulba. And then was blacklisted as a commie. He was like number 11 of the Hollywood 10. And um, made his comeback with uh, with Midnight Cowboy. Won an Oscar for that. And then I met him when he was uh, writing Coming Home, the Vietnam film. And uh, he he was one of the reasons I came to, to Hollywood to give it a try as an actor. And we dropped acid on his 60th birthday in that pygmy forest in Mendocino with him. And I remember lying on the ground underneath this huge redwood tree and uh, fully engaged in the trip. Mm. And I rode over and said, Waldo, you're 60 years old today. You're such a wise man. What's it all about? And he looked at me and he said, Fucked if I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the answer. That's the answer. <laughs> it's the, it is, man. It's not the destination. It's the trip. <laughs> it's the journey, man. Yeah. The journey, right? <laughs> and, 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 and that's why, I mean, you know, you, you as an individual, I mean, you are such an inspiration because you've, you've dedicated your life to preserving and telling other people's stories. And I think that that's part of the answer too is that we stop pretending like we think we know everything and we just we have one mouth and two ears for a reason there's a reason why the 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 ratio is asymmetrical <laughs> we're meant to use more of the other one yeah right and i think that people such as us creative people who have an open heart and an open mind they are seen by the powers that be as a threat Surely okay. you've been seen as a threat throughout the years. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, and been called a crackpot and a dirty <laughs> hippie and all those kinds of things. Yeah. Mm. So how, like, how have you been able to stay on this journey? Like, what has, what has been? Uh, a lot of generous friends, you know, because yes. it's uh, not always money-making. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to live a life like Kenneth Patchen, the poet, said, without ever earning a single blood rotten dollar. Right. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, 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 my sister became very wealthy in Silicon Valley, mm -hmm. and she's been very helpful to me and my family over the years. And uh, because I, I don't do things just for money you know I, I do what my heart tells me to, to do right and um, I, I I try to create something every day of my life mm. to bring something into existence that didn't uh, appear before 
And that could be photographs, it could be drawings, it, it could be interpersonal communications, it can be a word of en enthusiasm to a young person that's so important mm -hmm. to, to tell people that they can do what they dream about doing. Just, you know, take that first step, go out and do it. What you're doing is terrific, I love this. I can see you five years from now being well known for this. Keep at that because you're good at it, you know? And yeah. um, in my younger years, you know, words of, uh, of encouragement from Waldo Salt gave me the courage to come to Hollywood and see what I could do here. You know, I, I ended up narrating an Oscar-winning documentary, speaking of the Oscars today, and, and becoming a... Um, um, a well-known voiceover guy for many years. Uh, I was the voice of Time Warner audiobooks for six years, and I've narrated. I've lost counts of all the films I've narrated. Forrest Gump. I'm in Forrest Gump. I'm the announcer <laughs> at the White House when he goes to visit Kennedy, and he has to pee so bad. And I'm the announcer at the bicentennial celebrations, and uh, a, a movie called Can't Hardly Wait about kids last day in high school i'm i'm the love jock at <laughs> nine o'clock tonight it's a full hour of mandy <laughs> I, got a lot of stuff. I was the voice of bill gates most recent book on tape the and climate disaster one uh, no, oh, actually, no, it's not his most recent anymore. No, it's oh, big, it was the business. Yeah. At the speed of, of sound, is it, or something? I have it over there. The, the audio book. I got nominated for an, uh, an Audi for that, which is like Oscars for audio books. Right. And um, <laughs> yeah, Bill Gates. But, but for some reason, they decided to put Gates' own speeches in between the chapters. So you come to the end of the first chapter and I'm saying something like, uh, and then Paul Allen and I co-founded Microsoft. And then Bill comes on talking to <laughs> all these people. And then I come back on in chapter two as Butch Bill. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, the, the other thing too is in, in our lives, doing what we do there's so much fear in doing it you know it's kind of like uh plato's allegory of the cave you leave the cave it's so you know you can't just go back and <laughs> i think that security today is is our new is a new form of bob marley talked about mental slavery yeah. right mortgage is latin you can look this up for death grip so taking that leap of faith which you took it's paid off for you, but it's like, oh man, there is so much fear in this world that holds us from who we can be. Yeah, absolutely right. So, you know, as a teacher, this is a wonderful job for you because of your positive attitude and what you want to instill in your students mm -hmm. when they're still at that malleable age. You know, 13, that's, that's, a, that's a turning point. Especially, right. especially for girls. And um, it, 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 that's when you need love in your life almost more than, than any other time. You, you have so many fears and so many expectations and so many hopes. Mm. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. So kind of last two questions for you. And, and again, so much things to say. I mean, truly wonderful, wonderful uh, title. Um, well, I stole but, it from Bob. <laughs> of course, from, from his song that was, was that on the, which album was that from? Oh, God, I, I, I think it's Survival, isn't it? Or, or maybe not. I, I'm blanking at this point. I'm right. very embarrassed not to answer that question. Yes, no, yeah, no problem. But, but the message of that song is, you know, I, I tell people all the time, the most important resource is time and what you do with it because it it's finite, you know, at, at least in this shell as this uh, person and Brian green, who is an astrophysicist, mathematician, amazing guy, his most recent book uh, until the end of time 
so beautiful in the sense that we are here for but a brief uh, fraction of a time in the cosmic scale. And really what matters is the connections that we have in that time. And there's so much love, so much hate, and, and, and there's destruction and there's creation. And that's what it comes down to is what are we creating and what are we doing with the connections that we make? Yeah. And it's about giving back like you've I'm, done your whole life. You get what you give. He, I, I, the coconut monk was a little four and a half foot tall hunchback who had, hadn't lain down in more than 20 years. And he had an island of people who dropped out of the North Vietnamese Communist Army, the South Vietnamese Army, even mm -hmm. a few American deserters, and a bunch of Taoists. And they had a, a sandbar about a mile long in the middle of the Mekong River. The North Bank was controlled by the Americans, and the South Bank by the Communists. They fire rockets and mortars over the island, virtually never touched the island. And it was the only place in Vietnam I saw happy people. And I was brought there by Sean Flynn, Errol Flynn's son, who was lost in Cambodia, and uh, and Johnny Steinbeck, the son of the author. And uh, I went down there several times during 1969, met my first wife there. And the coconut monk said, the less you want, the more you have. Mm -hmm. And he who desires nothing has everything. Those were words that I like to live by. Of course, when I look around seven right. Florida ceiling of Marley and reggae memorabilia and history, I uh, I realize there's a a little bit of hypocrisy there. But I I want to get rid of all of this stuff. You know, yes. I'm almost seventy nine now, and I, I want to deaccession this stuff and share it with the world. Right. And I, I finally found, I think, the proper uh, arrangement to do that. And uh, they promised to build a museum in Montego Bay to house my collection and make it available wow. to the public uh, with, while respecting all the artist rights and uh, keep it intact forever. So that's that's my life's goal. And damn it, I'm going to stay alive until I see it happen. I hope. Well, Please. Well, God. <laughs> well I, I, yeah, I mean, your, your energy, um, you know, you are, you are a young man at heart, my friend. Yeah. yeah. You know, you're that that sure. wayward warrior. You've never lost that. No. And and Bob Marley talks about, and I'm 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 paraphrasing here, please correct this this quote, but you win the race the day you stop running. Something something words to that effect, I recall. Mm. And that's a quote that sticks with me. I should share some of my writing that I've done with you about the difference between competition and cooperation. And oh, wow. yeah, I, you know, I have a story about that. And one of the people I took to the island of the coconut monk was a man named Rodbeer Singh. He mm -hmm. lives in Toronto now. He was an Indian Sikh who rode his bicycle around the world for peace. Mm -hmm. He went to 108 countries. He was decorated at the United Nations by Uthant. And uh, I just talked to him a few days ago. In fact, we're still friends. Uh, just an amazing guy. And he told me this story, uh, the difference between an involvement and commitment. Mm. And he said, a chicken and a pig were having a conversation. And the chicken said to the pig, well, I'll give mankind eggs and you can give them ham. And the pig said, wait a minute now, for you, that's involvement. But for me, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what a good what I mean what a good metaphor, right? Like in yeah, terms of yeah. <laughs> what are you giving? What are you really giving, you know? And if it's at the you price of your soul, you, give, you get Yes. You yeah. But never your, you know, like we these Faustian deals and I think commercialism is a Faustian deal is that you you sell your soul for profit. And and that always ends in destruction of self. I, I feel in some way, you know, we must shed that skin either, you know, in, in the various degrees. My last sort of two questions for you is this, this, the family acid. Now I have a young daughter, she's 19 months old oh, and I feel, 
I feel for her because her I'm I'm a fucking nut, man. She's in for it with her father because you know I'm just not normal, my friend. So for somebody such as yes, I know. Well, you you show me somebody normal, I'll I'll point at somebody who's truly strange. But anyways, um, uh, normal is just an undiagnosed ailment. Yeah, normal is again mental slavery to me because mm-hmm. you're not being yourself. So. Yeah. What advice do you have for somebody with a young family, you know, and just how to raise, because your daughter's incredibly successful uh, in all the endeavors that she's taken on. What what advice do you have? And my son's an incredible musician. He's got albums uh, on a label in Berlin of his electronic music, and he's been a concert promoter and just a great photographer and writer too. I, I'm proud of both of them. And it's just, you know, we didn't have any preconceived expectations for what they should do or be. And whatever creative talent they expressed, we tried to give them the materials to follow that uh, or lessons or, uh, you know, paints, uh, cameras, just let them tell you who they want to be. Let them create themselves. Let them create themselves and, and be positive all the time with them. And everybody makes mistakes. Don't worry mm. about it. This will just help you do better the next time. And, you know, be positive and constructive. That's all you you can hope to do. And, and they'll tell you who they want to be. Don't you be never- censorious. Don't be censorious. And 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 one thing that I'm kind of picking up from you is that you never appeal to shame. Oh God, no. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. Yeah. Something tells me uh, that about you for whatever reason. Well, now, what should you be ashamed of? <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Well, the, the other thing too is what what for you in your life, and this is a difficult question, but what has been the most valuable lesson? For you, seventy nine years old. Can you can you put it down to one? I think you get what you give. Mm. Yeah, and my if I had a personal motto, it would be aim high. Yes, I I can't stand it when when I meet a young person and they say, oh, I I couldn't do that. Mm. Why couldn't you do that? All right, if, if you're a cripple, I know you can't ride a bike, but, you know, if you're talking about goals in life that you'd like to achieve, go for it. Mm. Go for it. Don't don't think negatively. Don't give yourself reasons not to pursue something. Mm. Pursue it. Tell, follow your heart. <laughs> I heard... Oh, what's his name? The, the, the God of a Thousand Faces uh, guy. You know. Jim Carrey. <laughs> no. No, oh, okay. No, the, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 there was, he did a PBS series back in the 80s about mythology. Uh, what's his name? Names go when you get older. <laughs> It's just too they much. go when you're right now too for me. Oh, the hard drive gets full. Yes, but um, he was he was world famous professor of mythology, and um, when I I saw him speak at the end, he had questions and answers, and a woman got up and said, "Well, you know, I've just listened to you for the past hour and a half talk about all of these different things, and and I don't understand what any of it has to do with reality." And when the laughter stopped, he said, Madam, there's no way you can use the word reality without quotation marks around it. Right. (laughs) I mean, that that ties into is everything just subjective or is there an objective truth? My friend Bob Watt, the exterminator poet who was an insincere Zen master and wrote deliberately bad poetry so you could compare yours to his and feel much better about your own, (laughs) is the man who created the phrase, reality is a cop-out for those of us strong enough to handle drugs. Right. That he used to say, don't forget, 
I am you disguised. I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> you really start to strip it down. You, you see, I mean, even with kind of COVID-19 and all this, we were fighting each other for toilet paper. We are held together by a thread, a thread of sanity, right? But maybe going back to you show me somebody who's normal. I'll tell you somebody who's truly strange. <laughs> so Roger, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's, it's been, we're going on two hours here. I, uh, I thank you so much. Um, you know, like it says so much things to say truly, this is one of the most remarkable, uh, history books that I've ever read in the, in the vein of Zora Neale Hurston, uh, in terms of oral history. And, and trying to capture something that is as authentic as possible to its, to its wow, thank uh, you for subject. Saying. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks. So to anybody, please, who wants to know more about, you know, the man, the myth, the legend. I mean, I, I know that's a, a, you know, people use that all the time, but in this case, it's true. Yeah. Check out your book. So thank you so much. This has been a joy, Rob. Keep up your good work. I look forward to talking to you again, and you have an open invitation to come and visit the archive. I, I'm going to take you up on that when the world opens up. Oh, good. Uh, Roger, uh, Roger Steffens, everybody, thank you so much. One love. One love.